Now, as part of a two-day series, our reporter Brian O'Connell has been talking to some Irish men who pay for sex regularly. This relates to legislation that was approved by the Cabinet and seeks to criminalise the buying of sex. It still has to be passed through the Oireachtas. Now, later we'll be joined by some interested parties, including advocacy advocacy groups uh, expressing their views. But yesterday, Brian, uh, you brought us the story of one man who feels that buying sex is more honest than picking up dates in a nightclub where there's perhaps a lot of drink involved. What Mm -hmm. have you got today? Good morning, Sean. Today I have another man um, whom I met and who pays for sex on a monthly basis. Now, this person is a 42-year-old professional. And again, like the man we had on yesterday, he's also single. But I think his story is different, this man today. Now, at his request, we have disguised his voice. I let him introduce himself in this first clip, Sean, where he talks about when he first started paying for sex. I'm working in the legal area, a professional in the legal area. Um, just general, or just a normal kind of guy, shy, maybe quiet, don't socialise much. And tell me then about when you started paying for sex. Um, it just happened by pure kind of fluke one day. I was just uh, on the internet and I just happened to type in escort and in the area where I'm living just typed in that location and discovered there was websites there that uh, made it look like it wasn't that big a deal to, to contact someone because I'd, I'd, I'd actually thought about it a lot over the years before of doing it, but I just kind of never went through with it. It was kind of something I'd said, oh, I could, I could never actually ring up. I wouldn't have the courage to, to ring a woman. I wouldn't know what to say on the phone, and it would just be too embarrassing, so I just shied away from it. As I got older, I kind of probably was, wasn't, I was a bit more confident than I used to be, so I just said, I'll, I'll give a ring and see what happens. So, Brian, you, you said that uh, this man's story is slightly different to the one we heard yesterday. Obviously, yeah. one big difference is he, he didn't want to be uh, he broadcast using his natural voice. No, I think because members of his family listened to the show was one of the reasons. Now, he referred to shyness in that first clip, Sean, and this shyness and social awkwardness, I guess, meant that this person found it very hard to be intimate with women right up until the age of 40. I'd never been, never been in, a, in a proper relationship, no first date kind of thing nothing ever never kind of went beyond that so you'd never had sex with someone so i never had sex i just kind of carry this around with me my whole life i didn't really leave it get to me just kind of put it out of my head but i knew deep down that people like family and friends would were probably thinking like why is that guy always single does he ever does why is he never with a woman he must have a girlfriend or how could he go his whole life to 40 without having never had a girlfriend but so the reason for contacting an escort the first time was it physical or was it more emotional it was both really it was like the fact that I, I'd never been close to a woman I never kissed a woman that's the truth like I danced with women maybe at discos wanted to see what was I missing Do you know like yeah what was I basically missing out on because and I wouldn't have ever never I would never have told anyone either our friends or anyone that it was very it was just too embarrassing to say that to admit that I was a virgin at that age so it would have just all been kind of glossed over whenever people would talk about that kind of stuff I would just shut up and say nothing and can you describe that first time I felt like it was a good experience I I'm just an honest kind of person so I, I would have uh, told the es- I told the escort that I, I, I went to see straight away like I was shaking like and she was asking me like what why are you shaking and I told her what was going on. I said, I've never, be- I've never even been with a woman before in my life. I said, so this is all new to me. I don't know what I'm doing. And, like, she was, like, understandable and fine about it and was a good experience. So it did give me confidence afterwards in speaking to women or approaching women. I wouldn't, I don't feel as nervous now if I start talking to a woman. I, I just kind of, I'd be more natural and just start the conversation, start talking about something. Whereas before I would have kind of just got all shy and, didn't get tongue-tied and not know what to say. So, Brian, there we are, the man. He found himself at the age of 40, having never been intimate with a woman, and for him, paying for sex with a prostitute was the solution he arrived at. That's the solution he arrived at, Sean. And after that first experience a couple of years ago where he said he, he was telling me he was shaking, he was very, very nervous, he, I suppose, maintained the practice of seeing prostitutes so that now once every about four or five weeks he would visit one. Now, like the person we had on yesterday, I suppose he feels that this new legislation should draw a distinction between the prostitutes that he meets and those who may have been trafficked or who are forced into prostitution who meet and who, who men would then uh, meet and pay for sex.
uh, the last, say, two years, I've been seeing escorts kind of maybe once a month or so. That's about it. But then I, I kind of tend to stick to one or two escorts that I know because I prefer to, to get to know them as people and, you know, become kind of friends with them in a sense so that there's trust and there's a, a kind of a relationship develops rather than constantly skipping around and going to see different escorts. I prefer just to see one or two. Is there a danger then that you could substitute that for your chances of a relationship? See, there isn't. I, because I, I know, I, I know in my own um, mind, like what I'm doing, and I, I've spoken to to some family members about it, and like one or two, they weren't really surprised when I told them because they knew, they knew that I was all, I'm always quiet, and I, I never make the first move if, if I was in a nightclub and just have this fear of, of rejection, of going, maybe because I tried a few times when I was younger, you get rejected so many times that you tend to give up. I know what I'm doing, I know, like, it doesn't stop me looking for relationships. You, as you said, work in the legal profession. Now, if the current legislation is enacted, what you're doing at the moment will be classified as a criminal act. Yeah, and that's, I find that hard to believe, because I can thoroughly understand, like, the... Uh, the sex trafficking, the coercion, if anybody, if any woman is forced by any means or, you know, t to do sex work, obviously I'm totally against it. If, if I'm deemed to be a criminal, then I just don't understand it. What I'm doing, like consensual sex between two consenting adults, is completely different to sex trafficking, forced prostitution, coercion, all that. I think they're two completely different issues, but they're conflated into one. So again there, Sean, that point which was also made by the man we spoke to yesterday. I should say as well that this person, he's tried online dating over the years, uh, he's tried many other means of meeting people, but for him it never progresses. And Brian, how does he know or does he know or how has he satisfied himself that he's not dealing with women uh, who are trafficked or forced into prostitution? He seems quite confident on that point. Well, again, like the person yesterday, these are men who are using the services of escorts or prostitutes who are advertising themselves online through well-known websites. Uh, they are looking at reviews. They're satisfying themselves that these are professional sex workers. But again, you know, the argument could be made you can never be 100% sure that the person person you are meeting is there of their own free will or volition. Uh, I think that's absolutely a very strong case to make. But uh, he feels that the women he's meeting anyway are sex workers 100%. Right. And he describes the kind of women then that he meets for sex? Yeah, he chatted a little bit about that. And also, I suppose, uh, why it is really, I, I put the question to him, OK, so you lost your virg virginity at the age of 40 to an escort. So why do you continue now to pay for sex? Uh, they're not Irish women, no. But I, I have it. No, I did, I haven't met Irish women. Actually, there's there's not that many. But I have I have met a couple of English women. All right. And what about the costs? The costs. Visiting an escort once a month, the costs are reasonable. Mm -hmm. Say hundred euro for half an hour or something like that. And in that time, in the two years when you've been seeing escorts, have you had sex with somebody where you haven't paid for it? No, because never got the opportunity but it doesn't mean I haven't been trying mm. like I've been trying say since my 20s but there comes a point when you when you're rejected so many times that you it does put you off putting yourself out there if it is as you said sex between two consenting adults and it shouldn't be criminalized why is it then that you don't want your identity to be revealed the whole stigma around it because it's like oh he's a loser that guy why can't he why can't he go out on a Friday, Saturday night and just pick up a, a, a woman in a bar like any other normal guy would? There must be something hideously wrong with him or, you know, there's, there's some reason you, women must run a mile from him or he has problems of his own or... Just finally, maybe can I ask you about when you choose an escort, what are the things you look for when you're looking on, on the website? I read the profile, see what they say. I, yeah, I, re I read the profile carefully. I like, as in, I read it, every word of it. Um, yeah, I just look at the the age and the um, the services and the how much it costs and stuff. And like, it, I don't have any particular preference. I'm just like, I'm just basically looking. A lot of it is emotional. It's not all about sex. So I, I'm looking for a genuine, nice person to spend time with, because the sex is just one small part of it. It's a part of it, but it's not always the main part of it. Sometimes it's just like the fact of going to see 
a woman and, and spending half an hour or an hour in a woman's company, which otherwise might, would never happen. Sometimes I've even gone, there hasn't been any sex. It's just been, I go, I have to pay the money for because I'm paying for the escort's time and company. We sit, talk for about an hour about all sorts of different things. And, that, and there's no sex. Like Sometimes, or most times, there would be sex, but there have been sometimes where there's, there's no sex. I just come away from that feeling like I had someone to talk to. I just get a lot of stuff off my chest. So, Brian, that's mm. uh, d- d- another man's story we heard yesterday, mm-hmm. obviously, from, uh, from a different uh, individual. Mm-hmm. I, I, you get a sense that there's a, cl- a vulnerability about that man. There is, Sean, and, uh, and a loneliness, I guess. He comes across, I mean, I spent about an hour in his company as a, as a genuine guy. He's fine, he told me on one-on-one encounters, but he finds being in a group very, very hard. And he's also, he's a non-drinker, and he believes that that makes it hard for him to meet women socially. But I suppose, Sean, in fairness, you could argue the more he relies on prostitutes, for sex, the less likely really he is to have sex with someone without paying for it. Brian, thank you very much indeed for bringing us those reports. That's Brian O'Connell there, <coughs> pardon me, reporting now. I am joined in studio by Geraldine Rowley, Communications and Policy Officer with the Ruhama.ie. Uh, that's a support group for women who are caught up in prostitution and also by Mia de Fuiche, a survivor of prostitution. And in our Galway studio, we have Kate McGrew, who is a sex worker and a sex worker rights activist. Uh, Mia, first of all, what did you make of what that man there said by way of explanation in Brian O'Connell's report about paying for sex? Um well, it's something I've heard before. Uh, it's a justification uh, for their actions, but um, he claims that uh, loneliness and uh, inability to socially interact with women and build up a, uh, something substantial uh, leads him to um, purchase a woman uh, because that is what he's doing he's purchasing the body of a woman uh, to fulfill a sexual need and uh, to me that's just not acceptable but uh, I mean if he I I don't deny I mean I don't know the man but uh, he obviously has issues um, but maybe visiting someone uh, an expert a professional to deal with and combat those social issues or feelings of inadequacy, etc., um, that he's dealing with. Um, but uh, to go and purchase the body of a woman to satisfy your needs is certainly uh, not an answer and his uh, justification. You, you don't seem to accept his um, insistence that this is activity, albeit there's money exchange, between two consenting adults. No, because I don't believe that consent to bodily invade another human being can actually be bought like you would buy any other commodity. Um, I think it's a gross infringement of human dignity. And he says that he uh, is 100% sure that uh, these women are not uh, under organised prostitution, etc. Um, he has absolutely no way of knowing that. Uh, what he recognised, the symptoms of trauma bonding, Stockholm Syndrome, disassociation, no, he wouldn't be qualified to. Um, so he cannot... Uh, state that. Okay, well, let's hear um, a different view, perhaps. Um, Kate McGrew in Galway, what, what's, your, what's your take on what we've just heard? Um, I, I think what we can hear is that um, even the, the clients and sex workers were all sort of being patronised. I, I think it lacks a lot of information, imagination and empathy uh, to not consider that this can be an important service and a good job. It certainly uh, wouldn't be considered a great job because of the stigma and because we're lacking labour rights. What is your own sense of it? What kind of a career have you made of, uh, pro- from prostitution? Well, it's a job that really suits me. And uh, like I said, uh, it could be better if there were uh, less stigma and more labor rights. I think this um, this uh, p- potential law that's coming in, the reason why it's, um, it's so um, frustrating and scary is because it's, it's proven to not reduce prostitution, only to move it around, and it's not proven to stop trafficking. I'd like to make a couple of points about trafficking, if I could. Yeah, we'll come back to that, but just in, in regard to the kind of career that it can be, you you seem to have no difficulty about seeing it as what should be a legitimate way of earning a crust, so to speak. Um, but, for instance, in your own case, do you, do you, do you work with pimps? 
No, I work by myself, and um, again, it's uh, you know, I work by m of my own volition, and uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to pay somebody to watch my door to take bookings for me because that's considered illegal. I can't even uh, work in an in, in an apartment with another girl because that's considered a brothel. I think it's um, it's very objectifying to to say that they're purchasing a body because that's insinuating that when I have sex, I'm not using my mind or my feelings, and I find that very objectifying. And where do you get the clients from? A website. Do you advertise yourself or do you... I advertise my services on a website, yes. And how how do you know, um, or how can you know, Kate, that you're not exposing yourself to a very serious danger um, just by, by engaging in this kind of career path? I, I, I'm um, not naive about the fact that I'm in a, a room with uh, a man who is physically stronger than myself. Um, I take various safety precautions with myself, and there are safety precautions that we have amongst us in the community. And um, also, uh, that's why uh, I, I look for... I'm looking for better laws and full decriminalization so that um, we can be able to go to the police and have a trusting relationship with the police uh, if we need to re report abuse or coercion without threat of losing, of losing our livelihood or our housing. And have you been in situations where you have reported men or individuals or collectively uh, to the guards? I've never felt threatened, no. How long are you providing this service? I presume you're in Galway City. Um, I, I am today. <laughs> uh, I worked in New York City from the year 2002 and, um, and then worked for a while in Ireland as well. So I worked in New York for years and I've worked in Ireland for a while. How long are you here and what brought you to Ireland? I came on a holiday and I decided to stay. And what's business like? It's good. I, I really, um, I really like the clients. You know, I meet a lot of really interesting people, and they're overwhelmingly polite. How, how many different men would you see in the course of a week? Um, I mean, it depends on the day. You know, it could be two. It could be more. So it, it would seem, if if you if you're being paid the kind of money that Brian was he hearing about, that there's 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 good money to be made from it. There is, uh, like I said, it's um, it's a uh, challenging work a as well because of the stigma, particularly, and because of the lacking labour rights. And certainly, uh, these things are going to worsen, and it will be harder to sort of um, to uh, to like I said, to target uh, shady and aspects of the industry if if the work is criminalised. If I can bring you in, Geraldine Rowley, you are, as I say, communications and policy officer with Ruhama, which works with women in prostitution and is totally opposed to uh, it being available as a. Service. Again, we, we've heard different views uh, betwe as between um, Mia earlier and also Kate in Argoa Studio and the men we heard uh, Brian talking to. So what, what's your assessment? Is it, not, is, is it possible in your view uh, to take the view that Kate does? Look, this is a service that can be provided. It should be acceptable. It should be accepted, perhaps regulated. Yeah, and, and that's Kate's view, and we've heard her, uh, you know, articulate that, not just on this show, but uh, on other programmes, and she's entitled to that. But we have been working with women affected by prostitution for over 25 years now at the front line, and the vast majority of women in prostitution do not experience it, as Kate is talking about. Most women who find themselves entering prostitution, there's a backdrop of debt, poverty, coercion, sometimes abuse. Um, if it was considered as a career choice, why don't we have it on our school's curriculum? We know as a society it's harmful and in our organisation we see daily the psychological harm, the physical harm and it's not just to the women, I mean our, our client group are the women involved in prostitution but on occasions we have actually uh, spoken with uh, men who buy sex, very rarely but on occasions and we are aware of research which also shows that it can be harmful to those who buy sex, that a lot of them have negative feelings after buying sex. We also have met some women whose partners had bought sex and the devastation on partners and families. So we need to move it from the individuals that have been interviewed for uh, this particular um, package and it has been interesting that the two are single individuals because the vast majority of the buyers of sex are actually in sexual relationships and that has been proven in evidence. They would be research. either married or have partners. Yes and we have a, an outreach van on the streets at night time in the red light district and I have worked in it for years myself too and we would observe even some of the buyers, the cars come up, the baby seats in the back of the cars, there's marriage rings on fingers uh, so uh, you know 
unfortunately, maybe, uh, you know, there is a bit of a, a, a perception being sent out that it's a service to lonely old men. This is not the reality. The reality are, are young men who are inadequate in their dealings with the opposite sex? But, but as Mia said so rightly, if people have issues, maybe this talk therapy, this therapist, there is a way that you're not abusing uh, other people. And also, what needs to be recognised, and it doesn't seem to be coming out at all or acknowledged by those who buy sex, uh, organised crime is running the Irish sex trade and this again has been uh, the guards have said it in a Rockdus report Primetime did a very good investigation only a few years ago and it exposed the level of crime and we know it as well from the women we're working with very few can operate as independents very few and those buyers are contributing and are responsible to this organised crime and the violence to the women within it. Mia were you part of an organised crime set up when you were um, uh, working as a prostitute? No I wasn't um, I stayed mainly on on the street uh, for two reasons one it is safer because you can run um, or you can jump out of a car but once you're indoors and that door shuts um, there you are in a room uh, but also because if you advertise um, uh, the pimps uh, would have full control of uh, prostitution and the websites. There's now an estimated over 40 gangs, uh, criminal gangs running uh, prostitution in Ireland and, and that's verified by the police. But I mean, I would have known um, once you sign up to them, you know, or you advertise, uh, one of the first buyers uh, could be the local pimp or a runner belonging to him. And uh, you will be told that you work for them or you don't work at all. Uh, the niches of these con this country are very territorial about who profits and makes money or can make money from the sex trade. And uh, Jared's right, Paul McGuire's 12-month-long uh, award-winning documentary prove that beyond a doubt so um, I mean they wouldn't have a problem with uh, Kate speaking because she's doing their job for them so as long as uh, that view is put out there the traffickers and the pimps are Okay uh, just b back, back, back to you Kate in Galway before we go back to the points that you wanted to make about what the law should or shouldn't allow um, just pick up on what um, uh, Geraldine was saying there earlier about the vast majority of men who use prostitutes are in fact married or in relationships relationships. Well, uh, what I'd like to say is, first of all, my, my clientele really runs the gamut. So um, so it, it really is every kind of man that I can think of. Uh, and also, I, I, I recognize that Ruam are having this uh, sort of vision of what the industry is like, because, of course, uh, they are talking to people. If you're talking to Ruam, it's because you want to leave the industry in a certain kind of way. So, of course, that's their, uh, that's their perspective of, of what it's like. Um, also, organized crime, th this flourishes with criminalization. The, in Sweden, the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare, they review their law regularly. And in 2008, they reported an increase in dependency on third parties like agents, bookers or pimps to help them find clients because it was hard to, for, um, for sex workers to be getting in touch with their clients. And you don't feel that there's going to be any... Um uh, any sort of a explosion or sorry, uh, th there's anything to fear rather I should say from having legalised uh, legalised prostitution, you, you think the government should be going the opposite direction to the one that, that they're actually following at the moment? Well we don't want uh, what it's like in um, Holland and we don't want what it's like in Germany um, because it's still dealt with in the criminal, criminal sphere there. What we're asking the Irish government to consider is decriminalisation, it's the model as they have it in New Zealand so the work is dealt with in a business sector women can take their bosses if they're working in a house if there is abuse in the house they can take their bosses to court and there are uh, certainly incidences where they have done and that and won the cases and um, and even in New Zealand they've actually found that demand has gone down If so it is legalised then Geraldine Rowley you get rid of the criminal element Not at all and, and I mean uh, the Netherlands for instance and Germany in places where they've legalised it That's it what we at don't all want help. Yeah exactly Kate is right no woman in prostitution wants that but actually the law which goes through the final stage of the Northern Ireland Assembly today is a fantastic model of legislation and we are hoping that the South is following. It repeals legis uh, crimes against women uh, in prostitution like soliciting. It uh, enshrines in law support services to those in prostitution and it criminalises the buying which will shrink the, the trade for traffickers and pimps. So okay. it's, a, it's, it's a pro uh, those in prostitution. It's to help those who want to get out of it or need any services. And just to correct one point, we do know women who are independent 
independents and are out there trying to work on their own and they even tell us they're finding it much more difficult to survive on their own. There's turf wars and if for instance they're moving to a town they're getting phone calls saying if you're coming here you have to work for us. It's very difficult for independents. We'll watch this debate as it continues. Geraldine Rowley, Communications and Policy Officer with Rahama, also Mia Defuicha, Survivor of Prostitution and our thanks as well to Kate McGrew, a sex worker and sex workers' rights activist in Galway.